So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. So, thank you all you to join us today for uh, next this uh, cast talk. So, we are today here to to listen to the talk by Professor Alessandro Girader, that is a professor at the Federal University of Pampa, Uri Pampa, in at Alegretti. So this is uh, in the state of Rio Grande do Sul, closer to the border with uh, Argentina. Uh, so he is professor there since 2007, working on both on undergraduate and graduate courses in electrical engineering. He received a degree in electrical engineering from uh, Perth University of Santa Maria uh, in 2000, master degree in computer science from uh, Perth University of Rio Grande do Sul in 2002 and a PhD in microelectronics, also from UFRGS in 2007. Uh, in 2018, he worked as visiting research at Technical University of Munich in Germany. He coordinates research projects in the area of the microelectronics, especially in the topics of energy harvesting, motion sensing, analog IC design, and analog design automation. He is also co-founder of MOOCs, a startup specialized Alas, not MOOCs, MOVE. No? A startup specialized in development of uh, IMUs for motion detector. By the way, uh, this startup is a consequence of the participation of the team uh, led by Alexandre Girader that won the CAS uh, uh, student design competition a few years ago. So the finals were in Florence, in Italy, and uh, they got the old award in this uh, student design competition. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro, to accept our invitation. And um, the floor is, is with you to start uh, your talk. And um, please do your questions using the chat channel. And um, then uh, you are going to uh, have the to see the, the questions will be read to Alessandro, by the end of his talk. So uh, just now, a uh, small starting. Okay, Alessandro, the floor is with you. So thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm very honored to be part of the third season of the IEEE Casio Grande do Sul Talks. Uh, I'll talk today about uh, energy harvest circuits for IoT applications. Uh, first of all, I will show you my a, li a little bit about my institution, Unipampa, Universidade Federal do Pampa. It's located in the state of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil the southern part of Brazil, specifically in the city of Alegrete, that is close to the border with Argentina and Argentina here and here Uruguay. Uh, here is an uh, aerial view of part of the city. The city is crossed by the Ibirapuita River. Here we have a uh, a view of the opposite part, the other part of the city, showing the, the campus of Unipampa uh, there. And here an um, uh, aerial view of our campus. Uh, in this campus, we have uh, undergraduate and graduate courses in the technology, technological areas, such as uh, engineer and, and uh, computer science. Mm -hmm. And we perform our research uh, work uh, in the GAMA, which is the research group in microelectronics at, at Unipampa. This is a photo of the Unipampa team, a part of the Unipampa team. Uh, and also I'm part of the master degree course in electrical engineering that is also offered by the Alegrete campus of Unipam. Well, uh, in this talk, I, uh, I'll talk uh, about uh, the 
the, the small summary of this work, uh, we talk about the problem of the batteries, mainly uh, for the IoT devices. Uh, then the energy harvest for substituting the chemical batteries, the use of energy harvesting. Uh, the indoor light energy harvesting is, is a very specific application for the collecting energy uh, from the light in indoor ambience. And finally, uh, an example, example of the CDC converter target for indoor applications. Well, uh, it's clear that the concept of Internet of Things is present in our modern life. We are surrounded by different kinds of devices that perform different functionalities and in most of cases are so integrated with our habits that you do not perceive that they are there. The main characteristics is that all IoT devices connect to the Internet in some way by personal area network, or by local area network or by wide area network according to the application. Here we have the representation of a typical IoT system. We have the microcontroller and a, and a memory that is the central processing unit. In some cases, we have actuators to interact with the real, real world uh, and sensors or transducers to read some information from the external world and convert it to, into an electrical signal, uh, a radio to communicate with the internet through some wireless protocol, and to provide energy for all the blocks, it's necessary a battery. Here I'm considering that a typical IoT system is not connected to the wall outlet, but it's located in a place that demands the use of batteries. And batteries are a problem that I will address in this talk. The number of IoT devices is increasing very fastly last year. In 2020, the number of IoT devices achieved 11.7 billion devices and surpassed the number of non-IoT devices for the first time. Non-IoT devices are uh, mobile phones, tablets, PC, laptops, and others. And, and yet, yesterday was announced the number of IoT devices present uh, in the world in 2021. Uh, we achieved, reached the number of 12.2 billion IoT devices at the end of 2021. Uh, and the trend line indicates that this number will increase a lot in the next years. So we are going to the next 10 billion IoT devices in the next few years. And with this, uh, it brings a lot of challenges to deal with this large number of devices. Uh, the scalability in the, in, in the number of IoT devices uh, brings together with it the challenges in security, in the energy to, to feed the circuits and electronic waste. Specifically talking about the challenge of providing batteries for billion devices, it's a problem because most of the devices are placed in hard access places. For example, inside walls, inside the human body or other inaccessible places. And also in some cases, the device is located in inappropriate places, such as ne next to source of corrosion and so on. We have some scenes that demand the use of large number of sensors in a specific region, such as, in, for example, in building automation networks, in smart cities, and logistics and industrial sources. Industrial, sorry, industrial facilities. And if we go further, uh, we can imagine a world with one trillion devices. If that trend line confirmed, uh, we will reach this number in the next maybe 15 or 20 years. And considering uh, we are 
consider this number, how can we provide energy for all of them with one trillion batteries? Of course, not all IoT devices use batteries, but uh, considering that we, we have one trillion device, IoT device that demand batteries, what can, how can you deal with this? Uh, a paper presented in 2020, uh, 2017 described uh, new methods that the industry is working to extend battery life to 10 years for IoT devices. So let's be optimistic uh, that this will become a reali reality. Then uh, for a sanity of one trillion devices, it will be necessary to replace or recharge 274 million batteries every year. Consider that the battery have a lifespan of two years, which is a more realistic, sorry, a more realistic uh, scenario. In this case, every person in the planet would have to replace a battery every five days because we need to replace more than one billion batteries every year. It's clearly not sustainable. So, and, and if energy could be harvested from the environment and the use of batteries could be minimized, maybe this is a possible solution for this problem. This is a viable alternative uh, with energy harvesting. We are surrounded by natural energy sources such as light, wind, vibration, thermal, radio frequency. The question is how to e efficiently harvest this energy, since in some cases the amount of available energy is not large. But we, we can go even deeper in this question and imagine how it would be if you could substitute completely the use of batteries by energy harvest from the environment. In some applications, it can be viable. In this situation, the energy harvest from the environment must be immediately consumed. Uh, and we can only store the energy temporarily in small capacitors. This is called a better led system. The advantages are that the device's lifespan is greater than 10 years and it's cheap and it is easy to recycle. There is not uh, chemical substances involved like in batteries. Of course, there is a lot of disadvantages also, which limits the applications, such as the limited power generation and, and non-constant energy available. The energy is not constant. Uh, in the environment. So here's a representation of a typical battery-less IoT system. The battery is substituted uh, by an energy harvester here uh, that is able to convert the energy from a given source in, voltage, in a voltage level that is adequate for feeding the whole circuit. There are several challenges of a battery-less system, of course. The first uh, uh, is the inconsistent energy availability. The device must operate opportunistically according to the available energy. Uh, there is small energy storage capacity. So the energy needs to be stored in capacitors if that it, it, it is limited. Fragmented execution is a, the, is a problem uh, in the side of the firmware of the, the microcontroller. Since the processor frequently reboots, the software has to deal with fragmented processing. Temporal data is a very huge problem. Uh, time information is lost when the energy is interrupted. So the system must have some way to synchronize again the time information. Uh, constrained results make, the, make that processor must be very slow, operating in a few megahertz. 
with a small memory space in the order of some kilobytes. And usability. The system is, is hard to debug, have limited applications. But uh, these are the challenges that the technology are facing, and the idea is to surpass these challenges to have a battery system that is uh, useful for some applications. The intermittent behavior, which is a characteristic of, of this battery -less system, is represented in this chart here in the x axis. We have the time, and in the y axis we have the supply voltage available to the circuit. Supply voltage is not constant, so if it is below a certain value, the device is turned off. When the voltage achieves a given threshold, the device turns on and uses the available energy to process the, uh, its test, such as to read the sensor or send information through the radio. And when the supply voltage is lower than a value, the device turns off and waits for the energy to be recovered. We can see that all processing must be done in a small time window. And we cannot say that the size of this time window is constant because it depends on the environment conditions. So this is the some challenge of the, the intermittent behavior. The power limitation, of course, reduces the number of applications for better less systems, but uh, it's still interesting and it will grow in next years. In, the, in this case, the microcontroller should operate with a frequency of tens of megahertz and consumes some few milliampères. The radio is also limited to tens milliampères. Uh, which is enough to transmit information in some protocols, even nowadays. For example, Bluetooth Low Energy or LoRaWAN that consumes something on the order of uh, some milli, milli, milliampères or millibytes. The total power consumption must be smaller than, 10, than uh, 100 microvolts. And techniques of that cycle, that cycling, or turning devices on and off must be used. So we have a clear trade-off between the number of features that the application uh, is able to, to operate and the available energy. There are many energy sources available to energy harvesting, each one with a different power density, and different characteristics. Solar outdoor, for example, have a power density of 10 microvolts per square centimeter, which is one order of magnitude higher than the indoor light, that is in the order of tens of microvolts per square centimeter. Both are intermittent and indoor light presents low efficiency because it's provided by artificial sources as you can see after. Other energy sources have more or less the same power density, but the different characteristics. Radio frequency, for example, depends on the distance of the emitting source, since the energy of the signal is reduced with the square of the distance. Thermoelectric sources need high temperature difference to operate, and movement and vibration depend on the kind of movement and the amount of, of vibration. This graph is very interesting because it relates the energy density with the battery runtime for outdoor sun, for example. They are able to provide energy to a Bluetooth low energy radio or for a ZigBee protocol and indoor lights it provides energy for a hearing aid device or a thermostat or a smart card or, or a, an RFID, RFID tag. Uh, these power consumption levels are typical for current applications and we hope that in the future we can achieve circuits that demand less energy to execute the same tasks. 
So the energy harvest from the environment can supply energy levels for even more complex applications. The power we can harvest for IoT devices using harvesters compatible to the size of these devices, which in general are small, in the order of some few square centimeters, is some tens of microwatts, 30 microwatts, for example. Uh, then, well, what can you do with this, with, with this, uh, this level of available energy? Yeah, we can do a lot of things such as wireless sensors for ambient monitoring or predictive maintenance, uh, Bluetooth low energy beacons and tags, smart locks, ultra low, ultra low power electronics, and e-paper displays, for example. Those are things that we can do with tens of microwatts nowadays, even nowadays. Uh, so that are the main applications that we have to uh, to apply the energy harvesting techniques for ultra low power circuits. Well, in this sense, we are interested in collecting light energy to feed our circuits. That is the object of uh, our work. Light energy is easy to harvest through photovoltaic cells, the PV cells, which convert light into electricity by means of the photovoltaic effect. There are advantages of using PV cells in IoT devices, mainly due to the size. They can be very small. And the way we integrate the PV cell with the rest of the circuit, and the price, the PV cells are cheap, and PV cells are available in different technologies. The light energy is harvested mainly uh, in the visible range or close to it. Uh, depending on the light source, the energy spectrum is different in this range. The sunlight here, obviously, is the most dense. The energy is spread along all frequencies of the, the visible range. By the other side, the incandescent lamp presents more energy in the higher wavelengths. This line. Uh, fluorescent lamp has peaks of intensity of energy in some uh, specific frequencies. And the LED lamp concentrates the energy close to the region of the green, the wavelengths correspond to the, the green color. Nowadays, the LED lamps are uh, dominant in the market uh, for most of the, the case. Most of the cells, uh, PV cells, are optimized for harvesting sunlight and have small efficiency at indoor. Uh, amorphous silicon is the technology that presents better efficiency for indoor applications when compared to crystalline silicon or triple junction gallium arsenide. We can see in this graph that relates the light intensity and the the density of power that can be harvested. With amorphous silicons, it's possible to create thin film PV cells. They are customizable in terms of size and format. Uh, they are ultra thin, with only 0.2 millimeters of thickness. And they are very lightweight. Uh, and an important characteristic is they are flexible which allow the use in non-flat surfaces. But they are most expensive than the crystalline silicon PV cells. Uh, for artificial illumination, then, uh, we can harvest 6 to 35 microwatts per square centimeter with thin film uh, at indoor ambience, depending on the illuminance. Typical illuminance provided by the artificial lights are in the order of 200 lux for warehouses, auditoriums, lobbies, stairwells, or corridors, 500 lux in conference rooms, office desks, retail stores, libraries, living rooms, uh, until 1,000 lux near windows or below a light fixture. 
In the case of crystalline silicon, we performed in our lab the measurement of a small PV cell of 8 square centimeters in order to evaluate the price, in price the power generated by these cells. We performed the experiment at night and the light source was exclusively a LED lamp. We placed the LED lamp in a given distance from the PV cell in order to regulate the luminance and we measured the luminance with a luxmeter and the output of the PV cell was connected to a semiconductor parameter analyzer. Analyzer. Uh, it forced a voltage uh, at the output of the PV cell in order to emulate a load, and with this we can extract the current voltage characteristic curves for different loads. The luminance was var varied from more than 1,000 lux to only one lux. Uh, here in this, this graph in the left are shown the, the power generated by these PV cells for illuminance from 1,000 1, lux to 25 lux. And here in the right, the same graph for illuminances from 20 to only one lux. We can see that there is a point of maximum power called NPP maximum power point, which moves to the left as illuminance is decreased. This point is very important to energy harvest since the efficiency is increased if you regulate the output load to collect this maximum generated power. This point depends on the load that is uh, connected to the output of the cell. We can see that even for small illuminances, this behavior is present. The maximum power point is approximately proportional to the open circuit voltage. That are these points uh, of maximum voltage that in the output of the PV cell for different illuminances. The open circuit points also move according to illuminance level. It, it uh, reduces as the luminance is reduced. But the maximum power point is proportional to the open circuit voltage. This relationship uh, is approximately linear, as you can see here. These points are generated by the, the same measurement results. Uh, the maximum power point was 65% of the open circuit voltage. It's a good news since we measured the open. If, if we measure the open circuit voltage, we discover the maximum power point spending low resources. Well, there are several maximum power point track algorithms and PPT algorithms. Some of them are called true and PPT because they find the exact maximum power point. However, these algorithms are complex and can demand a lot of energy to work. And by the other side, the non-true PPT algorithms are simpler, but the estimative is not exact. The estimation of the maximum power point through the open circuit voltage is non-MPPT. For example, it's called a fractional VOC. Here we have then the, a trade-off between the energy necessary to find the point and the amount of energy we can harvest. So for an, an energy harvest IoT system, the main block is the power management integrated circuit, whose main task is to convert the voltage generated by the energy harvest source to a constant and usable voltage level. For example, this block can increase a generated voltage of 0.1 volts generated by a PV cell to 4.2 volts, which is the adequate voltage to charge a lithium ion battery. Or this block can step up or step down a voltage for regulated outputs, as is the case 
of a barterless system. Of course, this block must consume power as low as possible to be more efficient and must be able to do a cold start or uh, wake up in autonomous way when the energy uh, when there is available energy. Here we have the electrical model of a battleless IoT device. We have the harvester. In the case of light energy, this is the PV cell with an internal resistance. It's very important to model this internal resistance. A capacitor to store energy temporarily and a resistive load representing the circuit that uh, will receive this energy. The voltage delivered to the load must be stable, even if the voltage provided by the harvest is not. The behavior of the system is a, uh, a succession of intervals where the capacitor is being charged and charged. In each interval uh, is characterized by a specific state of the load's components. And we characterize the voltage of the capacitor through each interval using V0 and VCT. V0 represents the initial voltage of the capacitor at the beginning of the interval, and VC, root of T, is the temporal evolution of this voltage at time T. The, the voltage at the output can be described by this function. So we get to the DCDC converter, which is the circuit responsible to convert the harvest energy to a voltage level that is useful to feed the target circuit. It basically converts an input DC voltage into another DC output voltage. The voltage conversion ratio, VCR, it, uh, is the relationship between the output voltage and the input voltage. The, it determines if the DC converter is an up converter or a down converter. Up converters can be of type boost or charge pump, and down converter are book or a linear regulator. In an ideal case, there is no power loss and the efficiency of the converter reaches 100% under all circumstances. However, this is not true in our real world because we use real components and these components introduce resistive losses and the electrical power is partially transferred into heat. Uh, many other sources of power loss are also found in real DCDC converters. The most simple DCDC converter in this case is a step-down converter is uh, the linear series regulator. It can be modeled as a variable resistance that adapts in order to keep the output voltage in a fixed value. The resistance value of the resistor must be controlled in real time to ensure a constant output voltage if, if the output current is changing. Uh, since in this case the input current is equal to the output current, the efficiency is given by the relation between output and input voltage, which is the VCR. So efficiency drops when the V out is smaller than V in. It's proportional to the VCR. So the circuit is not very efficient at all. Another implementation is the low dropout regulator, LDO, which is an operation amplifier to implement a feedback loop here. This loop is between the input and output voltage. A transistor is used to control the current to the output, and a capacitor keeps the output voltage stable uh, even for a variable load. Uh, the operational amplifier compares the output voltage with a reference voltage and increase or decrease the gate voltage of the transistor. And this transistor is operating in linear region 
uh, and with this, it's possible to regulate the output. Again, the efficiency of the circuit is small because there are lots of energy in all these components and also uh, some loss in the form of heat. Other types of the CDC converters that present better efficiency are the switched mode converters. Basically, they can be divided in switched inductors and switched capacitors. Switch inductor converters are composed of inductors, capacitors, and switches, and theoretically, they are lossless under continuous input output. However, the implementation in CMOS technology brings some problems, such as the poor quality uh, of inductors and the large silicon area necessary to implement inductors which turns this implementation prohibitive in most of the cases. By the other side, switched capacitor converters are more attractive for CMOS implementation because it uses only capacitors and switches that can be easily integrate, integrated. However, they are not lossless in any pretext and the capacitors must present high energy density. But this kind of converters are uh, is the most used for energy harvesting. Here you have an example of capacity conversion. In the left, you have the representation of two capacitors in series, completely charged, some of their voltages. When you put the same capacitors in parallel, the charge is divided between them, and the voltage across the terminals is half the original voltage. For making this strategy, we need to change the structure of the circuit on the fly. And we can use switches to do that, as I, I will show in the next slides. Uh, recent research of fully integrated capacitive CDC converters is mainly focused on low power and sub milliwatts applications, which are compatible with battery-less IoT levels. So in a microscale IoT PV system, we have this block diagram. The energy is harvested by a small PV cell because the size must be compatible with the size of the entire device, the entire IoT device. Uh, a CDC converter transforms the harvested power in an adequate voltage uh, level that can be stored in an element such as a capacitor. Then regulated voltage can be used to feed an electronic circuit. We will have an example of a multi-topology switches capacitor the CDC converter. The circuit can operate as a voltage doubler or as a voltage divider, depending on the switches uh, and the configuration of the switches when we open and close them. We have six switches that can be open or closed by a control circuit <clears throat> and two capacitors. A fly capacitor to collect charge. Uh, fly capacitor that collect, collects charge from the input. Uh, and an output capacitor that is, is connected to the output. The, the input voltage is provided by the harvester, and the output voltage is, uh, is, is regulated according to the input voltage. For using these circuits as a voltage doubler, we need the operation in two phases. The first phase, which is one and four and six, are closed, and the remaining switches are open. The charge from the input is stored on the fly in the fly capacitor. In the second phase, switches 5, 3, and 6 are closed. And the charge in the fly capacitor is moved to C out, to the output capacitor. The terminals of the 
supply capacitor are inverted and the output voltage is the double of the input voltage. The same circuit operating as a voltage dividing, divider is shown here. In the first phase, switches one and two are closed. And the charge provided by, by the input voltage is divided between uh, the fly capacitor and the output capacitor. And in the second phase, switches three and four are closed, and six also are closed. Uh, and the fly capacitor is in parallel with the outs. Uh, now, the voltage in the output is half the voltage in the input. So, with the same circuit, we can uh, make uh, two different configurations to double or to divide, divide by two the input voltage. But for the circuit to work properly, the phases one and two must have a peri period enough to completely charge the capacitors. And this period of time depends on the value of the capacitors and also the resistance of the switches. So the physical implementation of the switches determine this period. And, and this period will reflect uh, at the end on the overall efficiency of the CDC converter. A common implementation of the switches is, is with a MOS transistor in a transmission gate configuration uh, with uh, one NMOS and one PMOS transistor. It results in an on resistance that is proportional to the VGS of the transistors. Here in this graph is a representation of the on transistor of the transmission gauge. Uh, but uh, this dependence on VGS can be a problem in the case of step up converters, since in some cases the voltage at the source of the transistor uh, is higher than the gauge voltage. And the transistor in this case does not conduct. Because uh, we have to, for NMOS, we have to have uh, a VGS uh, larger than, than zero. For mitigating this problem, we use a bootstrap circuit to increase the gate voltage and guarantee in this case that the switch will close in all, all circuit conditions. The combination of multiple topology converters can result in a multiple VCR, uh, the CDC converter. This is a converter that we proposed in our group. It is composed of four doubler divider blocks organized in a way that they can be reconfigured to provide different VCRs, different voltage convert uh, ratios. Another subtractor block uh, is included to sum or subtract two voltages that are the outputs of the double divider blocks. Uh, we, and with this, we can increase the number of VCRs. Uh, other blocks are also necessary for this circuit to work, such as a control block to generate the signals to close or open the switches. Uh, it is basically a digital block that receives the information if the output is higher or lower than a given reference. Uh, and they change the logic of the switches in order to change the configuration of the uh, of the divider doubler blocks, consequently uh, changing the VCR. The output in this design uh, is regulated to 0 0.5 volts, which is a voltage uh, adequate for ultra-low power circuits. That is the case for ultra-low power IoT applications. That is the focus of this work. Uh, and the input can be a, a, a PV cell. The voltage in the input generated by PV cell. Uh, in this case, the PV cell can go up to 1.6 uh, volts. 
So a total of 19 VCRs are available in this circuit, this circuit from 0 0.25 to 8. With this, you can make both step up and step down conversion. Here are some results for an input voltage of 0 0.54 volts, here in blue, and a regulated output of 0 0.5 volts in black. The VCR is 0 0.75, and you can see that the output goes from 0 to 0 0.4 volts in some microseconds. It's a very fast convergence. Uh, in green and orange are the intermediate signals inside the converter. Uh, here is, uh, we can see the capacitors being charged and discharged during uh, the phases of the conversion. Here is another example now for a step up conversion. The input voltage is 0 0.3 volts in blue, and the VCR is 1.5. It's important to note that the number of VCRs is limited and is also discrete. So the output voltage is regulated to a value as close as 0 0.5, 0 0.4 as possible. In this case, we achieved a fine output voltage of uh, almost 0 0.45 volts. This other example, the input voltage in black is changing over time, changing three times, and the control block must select the most appropriate VCR to keep the output voltage regulated to 0 0.4 volts. Uh, we can see that the change in the VCRs uh, is done in steps. Here is represented the current VCR of the converter. Uh, until the output voltage to reach the desired value. In this example, uh, the circuit was simulated for typical in corner situations. And we can see that the output voltage in green, blue, and red uh, for each case converges to the desired values. In green, you have the typical values. In, in blue, the worst case corner, fast, fast, and in red, the worst case corner, slow, slow. For all the cases, the output voltage uh, was regulated to a range of 0 0.4 volts, uh, more or less 10%. This is the layout of the proposed converter that implemented, you can see that the layout is dominated by the capacitors that are shown here in green. Here in the middle, we have the switches. So the occupied area is relatively large uh, inside the integrated circuit. And here we have the representation of the complex system with the switched capacitor converter shown here. The, the, this is the block that was described in the last, uh, last slides. Uh, and plus, uh, the startup circuit block, uh, a clock generator circuit. Uh, in fact, we have two clock generators. In this case, we, have, we need two to, to, uh, clock frequencies for the circuit to operate. Uh, the control block is composed of a lookup table uh, and a counter. And we, are, we have also two comparators to compare the output voltage uh, to a, a reference voltage and inform it to the control, voltage, control block if the output is higher or lower the desired value. A total of 60. Uh, no, of 70 switches signals must be generated to implement all 19 different VCRs. And all those, those blocks, of course, contribute to the degradation of conversion efficiency. 
since they consume energy. And the challenge is to minimize the store consumption in the design stage. Compared to other works, we achieved good results with an estimated peak efficiency of 90%, operated in 5 MHz to a regulated output voltage of 0.4 volts in uh, 180 nanometer technology node. The important specification here is the converter silicon area, which determines the converter energy density. Our area was in the same order of magnitude than other works in the literature. And so with this, uh, I'm going to the conclusions of this work. Uh, we could see that energy harvest circuits demand high efficiency since we are harvesting energy from the environment, but this energy is, is not uh, abundant in this environment. Uh, for these low power techniques are mandatory to design each part of the circuit to have the, the, the circuit that consumes less energy, less possible energy. And there is still a lot of work to do for achieving a butterless system for this kind of system to be a reality uh, and to be useful for uh, some applications. So uh, we have to bridge the gap between the power generated by the energy harvesting and the circuit consumption. Uh, this gap is reducing as we as the technology advances and we will reach this point in some time in the future. Uh, maybe, I guess, when we can harvest energy in the order of uh, hundreds of microwaves and the circuit consumption uh, be in the same level, at the same level. So uh, I'd like to thank the Gamma team for supporting this work especially Professor Lucas Severo and the graduate students Luis Felipe Machado Dutra and Luis Antonio Silva Jr. for generating uh, some results. And also uh, the undergraduate student Vitória Monteiro for helping with the measurements. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Well, thank you very much. Alessandro, for the very nice, interesting talk. So uh, please do your questions using the chat channel. Um, I see no questions for the moment, but uh, I have uh, one. So can you reinforce a little bit uh, more about uh, the energy harvesting for uh, chips that are implantable in... Uh, people or animals so uh, what are the best source of uh, energy harvesting for chips that are implantable in uh, human bodies no? mm -hmm. well in, in this case since, since the the chips are located uh, inside the human body we have uh, they are not uh, um, have not an uh, incident light over it, so we cannot use light energy, of course, but we can use other size, uh, other uh, sources of energy, such as radio frequency. Uh, it, it is maybe the, the most appropriate for this case, but uh, of course, uh, the, the depending on the application, as, as I, I said uh, in the, the presentation, the uh, the, the quantity of energy and uh, the availability of this energy is very important. So if the circuit must o to operate continuously, we have to have a continuous source of energy. And for this, with radio, radio frequency, the, it, it's the best alternative for implantable device. But uh, another option is to use also a thermal, thermal, thermal electric, uh, gradients, uh, but uh, 
it, I think it will not be very um, effective because uh, for this we need to have a difference of temperature. And inside the human body, the temperature is constant. We have no uh, a gradient of temperature. So maybe the radio frequency is the best option for energy harvesting in implantable devices. And uh, what about uh, movement? Yeah, movement is another alternative. Yes, but we have to use piezoelectric devices. Uh, implantable, in, in, implant, implanted in the body. Yeah, it can it can can be also an, an option, but uh, we, we cannot guarantee that the body is moving all the time when you are sleeping, for example. In general, we, we are we do not move, but uh, it's dependent. Uh, everything depends on the application. If we need to have a continuous source of energy or not. So the, there is a question that is quite associated by Cancio Monteiro. I was also preparing a question in the same direction. That So first he's giving his thanks for the very interesting talk. So um, he told that he has some questions. So do you also consider energy management secret in your proposed work. Uh, so I would also like to add to this that uh, how can uh, in an implantable chip in a body, the, the person can manage and to monitor the quantity of energy that he has available. No? So for example, if, okay. uh, if uh, it's by movement, so it means that when he is going to sleep, he need to know that he has sufficient energy uh, available till the morning where he's going to 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 do another exercise again so things like that but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes uh, in our work we are uh, interested only in the energy harvest circuit in the, the DCDC converter to provide a uh, um, uh, a constant output voltage to the circuit under the conditions that the input voltage harvest from the environment is not constant. Uh, so you are not considering the nowadays the energy management. But uh, it, of course, for an, uh, a, a final application, it is necessary. <clears throat> uh, and this power management circuit uh, is will, will depend also on the where the energy is stored in the IoT device. If you are, you are not using battery, that is our goal in the future, mainly inside the, the human body, uh, we will uh, use the the energy as he. Uh, at the same time, it is available. We do not store a large amount of energy to use in the circuit in some time in the future. Our energy is immediately consumed. So in this case, as I said, uh, the circuit have to deal with um, uh, non-constant uh, operation and a series of problems that are were addressed in, in this work. Uh, but if you, we have a, a, a small battery uh, that is recharged each, each time that the energy is available, so we have, of course, to we need to have an energy management circuit to uh, charge the battery and to uh, inform to the circuit uh, the conditions that the energy in order to, to decide if it will process some information now or it will wait for another time that they that, that uh, it had more energy available. I don't know if I answered the questions, but yeah, so um, another question. Uh, Kansu told you that uh, he had some question, but he wrote one question, so there is a second one.
Mm. I'm not seeing any reply for the moment. Um, so, and uh, another point related to implantable secrets, uh, what are the restriction restriction you can see about uh, the uh, technology, you no? Know, considering also the reliability of the the secret, you no? Know. Well, there is another reliability. question by Kansu mm -hmm. also that uh, also is related to technology. So I found that you use the 180 nanometers CMOS technology. So what is the threshold voltage value. I am just considering mm -hmm. the stability of the EH source, which will affect also switching activity of transistor. OK. Uh, we have used the 180 nanometer technology that has a threshold voltage of 0 0.5 volts. Uh, but uh, we can use uh, some applications that uh, are biased uh, in uh, that that use voltage below the threshold. Also. So it's uh, it's not a, a so uh, I think it's not so relevant in this case because there are low uh, ultra low voltage techniques that. Uh, can mitigate the problem of operating with a supply voltage below the threshold voltage. Thank you. So I see no more questions here. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro, for this very nice, interesting talk in a hot topic subject. No. So <laughs>